Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. If you guys want to stand with us, it's a small group today. If you guys want to stand with us, we have some cool music for you. Good morning, Grace Bible Church. Good to see you all today. We have one, two, three, four announcements for you today, and so I want to just uh, bring you up to speed on what's going on. VBS, the 25th through the 29th, we have 35 children that are signed up so far. Please invite your friends and your family. You can register on our website at gbcbellevue.org. This is the last day for you to sign the thank you cards that we have that we're going to be presenting. Uh, they are, by the way, information table, by the way. We're going to be giving one to Cornerstone and to their leadership to thank them for the use of their space. And then another one is to Luis, who has been our contractor and helped us put all this together. If you would, please take a minute to write on those and to express your appreciation. If you want, just 
sign that your name, that's great, but we want them to know that we do appreciate and care for them. Everything you would ever want to know about any of our ministries can be reviewed in our monthly emailed newsletter. Information table, again, out in the foyer. You can sign up for that to be on our Google group and receive those. You can also find the information on the website I mentioned to you a moment ago. Uh, and on the screen up front, they're kind of scrolling before services and then in our new church app. There is an instructional sheet on many of the chairs that are outlining how to download the app and the various ways it can be used. It's very, very helpful if it's used. Like anything, if you don't use it, it's real helpful. So if you need assistance, Allie would be happy to help you with that or in vocal lessons. Going forward, that was a joke. I'm not serious about that. Going forward, there'll be a limited uh, sign-up sheet at the information table. Anyone that's uncomfortable using the app, Julie will be helpful uh, for that as well. Birthdays today. Katie Powers on the 23rd has a birthday. <laughs> Rachel Leaders will be 17 years old on the 23rd. <laughs> Kelby Cock on the will be 16 on the 23rd as well. <laughs> and then anniversaries today. Eric and Becky Lundberg on the 20th, 26 years. <laughs> Happy anniversary to you. And Doug and Sherry Tweet on the 21st, 38 years together. Happy anniversary to them. <laughs> One other announcement I want to mention. On the 26th of July, the Hartfords are going to be hosting um, a Vital Signs Ministries letter writing party. Um, the letters will be sent to government officials businesses, persecuted Christians, and also Christian ministry leaders dealing with topics like sanctity of life, religious freedom, family, and moral values. Uh, they will be there to answer questions if you want to know, for example, what the definition of a woman is and other biblically-centered concerns. Everything that you need to take part in that, stationery, cards, pens, stamps, topic information to help you because Say, you know, you want to write to a congressman, and uh, you say, I'm really not sure what to say to him or her. I don't know how to write this letter. They're there. I've been to many of these, and they're very, very helpful. And so those are provided. So are cookies, coffee, and tea. So it's well worth it. Uh, they do need RSVPs, so please contact them uh, at their home number that's in your directory or dennyhartford at gmail.com. So they're willing to help. And also, by the way, they're willing to help us set them up here at this location. And so if you have a heart for that, and you say, well, I'd really like to, to host something like that. It really sounds interesting. It's a good, good time, and they'd be glad to uh, help us set that up. So that's that. We want to take a moment uh, at this point in time to, um, to take the uh, bread. Uh, as they're getting ready to pass the bread out, I also want to tell you that if you would like to give to our ministry, we'd love to have you do that. Black boxes in the back as you exit that can help you with that. And then our Venmo app. So we appreciate your support for the ministry. We sure need it. Summertime always gets a little bit sparser. So uh, we always could appreciate your help that way. Hi, Allie. How are you? Good to see you. Every week we begin our service with the bread. If you're a visitor here, we bracket our service that way. The bread at the beginning, cup at the end. And we do that because there's nothing more important to us than the cross of Jesus Christ and the eternal life that that can bring us. The cross represents the fact that there's no way we can somehow earn or deserve our standing with God. And the reason we celebrate this is to remember that Christ paid for our sin. And if you believe in Jesus Christ's gift of everlasting life, that's given to you freely. And so uh, as we take this bread, if you're not a believer, uh, we're, we'd love to tell you how you can have that gift, but right where you sit, if you place your faith in him and in that promise he made to give you that, he will give you that. If you're a believer, this is a good time to take a moment of silent prayer just to consider your heart before the Lord. Let's take a moment and do that.
as we're passing, just a reminder, we're going to be taking the bread together. Please hold on to it. We all have the bread now. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, I thank you for this bread that represents the body of Christ. And it represents the fact that we could never come to you adequately. All of us have failed, and you're perfect. So thank you for the sacrifice that makes us one body in him. In Christ's name, amen. Partake of bread. I think it's fair to say that on a functional level for many of us, maybe most of us, maybe all of us in this room, there are times in our lives that we just don't feel God's going to do anything about what we pray about. We might believe if we were asked, we might say, oh, I do believe God's all-powerful. I bet everybody in this room would say that. If I asked you whether God loves you, I'll bet that everybody in this room would say, I believe he loves me. But imagine that you're in the midst of a crisis. Imagine that you're at that time when you're on your way to the hospital and somebody that you love has hit the floor like my dad did with a heart attack. Or somebody's cut themselves, you're headed to the emergency room, it's bleeding pretty bad and you're praying about it. And as you're driving, you've got your pedal to the metal and you're praying and Lord I know it's wrong to speed I've got to speed maybe in that case it's not a terrible idea but I don't advise it I remember one time driving to the hospital and our son Chad was in the back seat and he was having an unbelievable migraine never had it before and it was it was terrible and he kept saying over and over again dad it hurts it hurts so bad and on the way to the hospital I was flying And on the way down the road, I said, please, Father, don't let my son die, over and over again. And my decision was pretty spiritual. I just decided if the police wanted to stop me, that would be okay with me. In fact, I think if they had, I would have gone like this, lead me to the hospital. But there are just times in our life that we get gripped by fear and we get gripped by panic. And we, our beliefs sometimes just sink out of the way. Plain reality is we don't believe sometimes God's really going to help us, and we feel we have to do what we're doing, even if it involves sin. David got like that. David had been trusting the Lord, and he saw his wife help him. He saw his best friend deliver him. He saw the prophet Samuel help him. He saw the Lord help him. But it began to wear him down, and he began to panic. And so he went to the priest at Nob, that's a city, And when he went there, he lied to the priest. What are you doing here alone? Um, I'm here on the king's business. I I just need some provisions. Oh, okay. Yeah, why don't you have everything? Oh, I just left. I left quickly. Uh, By the way, I didn't bring a sword. Do you have a sword here for you? Oh, here's Goliath's sword. Ooh, man. There's nothing. This is the best weapon going. This is great. How about the showbread? Gave him the showbread provisions. There was a man that was there named Doeg, and he watched all this happen. So David lied because he had panicked, and then after that he leaves, and when he leaves, he goes to Gath. You know, there are certain phrases that go together. Goliath of Gath. This was Goliath's hometown. Remember, he had, he had beaten that giant, but he goes there because he's scared. He knows that Saul's not going to go into Philistia, so he goes to the Philistines and he hears them say, hey, this is the same guy about whom they said David has killed, Saul has killed his thousands, David is ten thousands. This is a champion in Israel. He hears that, he gets scared. So what's the mighty king of Israel do? The future king who's going to be the 
uh, who, from whom Christ will be in his heir, in his line, his family line, his lineage. He starts drooling on his beard. He gets down, scratches the doorpost. He acts like he's crazy because he's so scared. And they say, this guy's nuts. Just get him out of here. David had lost it. Well, what God did was he exerted pressure on David, and he allowed life to collapse around him so that David began once again to trust the Lord. Have you ever seen that happen in your life? You ever had it happen in your life that God will allow a series of events to take place so that your only hope is in him? And gradually, God brings you home. This is what happens to David. David came home. We started looking at that last week. And this week, we're going to look at David realizing that the Lord really was his helper. So, the Lord is his helper. And now we are in chapter 23. Let's take a look together. Chapter 23. It is on. It is on. It says on. All right, let's read chapter 23. Here's what it says. Then they took David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting at Keilah, and they're robbing the threshing floor. Therefore David inquired of the Lord. You see something different here? When he went to Nob, he didn't inquire of the Lord. When David went to Nob, he just made up his own course of action. But here, David does. David does go to Keilah. And, and uh, he inquires of the Lord before he does. Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Now, the men hear about it. And verse 3 says this. And David's men said to him, look, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So they get panicky. And in your notes, if you notice in 1 to 3, we, we note these things. First, at Nob, David never asked God for guidance deceived the priest, and it led to a disaster. This time, David is different. David goes to God. And we make this point, and the point is this. Oh, okay. uh, We're fine. We're fine. Failure can be a great teacher when we learn from mistakes. Failure can be a great teacher when we learn from mistakes. I have a question for all of you. Have you learned more from your successes or your failures in life? It isn't to say that God wants us to fail. It isn't to say that God doesn't want us to succeed. It is to say this, that God will allow our feet to get knocked out from under us so that we'll learn to him, from him, so that we'll be humble before him and we'll go to him. Failure can be a great teacher if we learn from our mistakes. David is a man here who's learning from our mistakes. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus, when he deals with Martha and Mary, when he's dealing with them, David now, or uh, the Lord Jesus tries to teach them because here's Mary seated at his feet listening to his word. Martha's carrying the load by herself. Mary's teachable. Martha scolds and says, Lord, don't you care that my sister doesn't help me? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, no, in effect, she's chosen the better part. She's teachable. So my question to you is, is this. Are you teachable? Are you a kind person? Are you a forgiving person? Are you a person that trusts the Lord? Do you have a problem with temper? Do you have a problem with laziness? Do you have a problem with lust? Are you teachable or not? Jesus said few things are important, really only one. And David here shows a teachable heart. So, next point. The men that David are with will eventually become a mighty fighting machine that delivers Israel. That's told in 1 Chronicles 12 in your notes. But at this time, they're inexperienced and they're afraid. David's got a problem, and he's got to deal with it properly. If you remember before, it said all the ragtags of Israel came to him, people that were in need, the people that were in trouble. All these people came to David, and David had to learn how to handle them. So he goes to the Lord again and said, hey, is this, are we good on this? And the Lord said, yeah, I'm going to deliver you. And so David goes to the Lord and apparently uses that as a basis to encourage him. Let's look at verse 4 here. Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah, uh, went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. <laughs> so I got a little bit of bonus here. And David saved the inhal- inhabitants of Keilah. Now, it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. And an ephod had the Urim Thummim. 
and they used those to determine the will of God. That's how they found out what God wanted to do. Things were different back then than they are today. There was more direct revelation from God. They did not have what we have, and it, I want you to zero in on this because this is important. We have the completed canon of Scripture. We have the completed Word of God. They didn't have that. So in the time of the judges, they would speak directly. God would give them direct revelation. In the time of the prophets, the direct revelation would come from them. And Hebrews talks about how God in times past spoke to the prophets in many portions and in many ways, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things. We have something they never had. We have the complete scriptures. And I want to make a big point about that this morning. But let's look at your notes again. Unlike Saul, David takes his problems to the Lord and shows real leadership in attacking Keilah. And I want to note this. The second point is this. A problem is, a, is not a bad situation. A problem is your reaction to a bad situation. A problem is not a bad situation. A problem is your reaction to a bad situation. If there's a God in heaven, and by the way, there is, if there's a God in heaven that loves you and has the power to handle it, he's not nearly as concerned as what you go, what you go through as how you go through it. And your third point, I note, God cares more about our character than making us comfortable. Now, if it were up to me, I would change that, but that's not the way he operates. God is far more concerned about my character than he is about what I go through. My comfort is not his primary goal in life. God wants to make sure that we become more like Jesus individually and as a fellowship. Is it possible that God will cause problems in this fellowship to do the same thing? Is it possible that God will allow Grace Bible Church to go through difficult times so that corporately we'll learn to love each other, to be kind to one another, to forgive each other, to be long-suffering and patient? Because the problem with Grace Bible Church is us. The problem with Grace Bible Church is that it's populated by sinners. And we're going to frustrate one another. We're going to make each other angry. We're going to disappoint one another. And if we don't have Christ-like attitudes, we're just going to become a club if we come at all. Be like a Kiwanis club, not a church of Jesus Christ. But that's true in your family, tr too. The fundamental question is this. Do I believe there's a God in heaven? Because your family is going to go through difficulties. They're going to go through financial difficulties. They're going to go through relationship difficulties. And the question I have for you, whether you're a child, a mom, or a dad, a grandparent, whatever it might be, are you going to lead your family? Do you know that I've seen families where a child in the family is the most spiritual person in the home? And I've seen children change families because they trust Jesus Christ. So my question to you is, what kind of an influence are you in your marriage, in your family? Are you making things worse? Do you panic and create an environment in your home where it's difficult to live life? I live with a woman, uh, she's my wife, I live with a woman every day of my life who's the most forgiving person I've ever known. She helps bring me back to Jesus all the time because even when I sin against her and I say to her, you know, I'm sorry I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that or done that or whatever it might be. Cheryl will say to me over and over again, it didn't happen. It's not a problem. And she helps bring me back to Jesus all the time. What are you like in your marriages and in your family? You might be sitting there thinking, I can't stand my folks. They really, I can't wait till I get out of the house. Can I ask you this? Have you ever thought about being an instrument of grace to your parents, to helping them grow, to help your children grow? It's convicting to me, and I hope for all of us it stirs our hearts. So David responded to God's revelation with faith, and he had a great victory. There are things that are different between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is not. When we respond by faith to the Lord, it encourages our family. I can't tell you the number of times Cheryl has said to me, Dan, thank you for trusting in the Lord. Thank you for the way it impacts my life. That was maybe three times. So today, revelation from God is different, but it's no less adequate. There's a passage I want to lay at your feet today, and we're going to come back to this. But I want you to think about this. This is kind of worth your money today. I love this text. I heard a message 40 years ago that was life-changing, still changing my life. Because Manny talked about how we look for direction from God. God, should I buy these jeans or should I 
buy this house? Should I date this person? And he quoted 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures inspired by God. In, in the original, it means it's God-breathed. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I have a question for you. Do you think that's true? Let me say it again. The Bible tells us that this book is God-breathed and that it's profitable for teaching, for reproof. If I need to be taught something, that book can teach me. For reproof, if I need to be corrected, it can correct me. For instruction, if I need to be trained, it, for training righteous, it does all that. What's the result? When I'm in that book, and that book is in me, I'm adequate, equipped for what? Every good work. Men and women, does this church believe that? Do we believe that that book really is life-changing and that it, we can be equipped for every good work? Or do we somehow need something else in our lives? And how do you treat it? I want to come back to that, and I want to tell you a story in a moment. But I also want to give this caution in your notes. Satan, the Bible says, comes as an angel of light. That's in 2 Corinthians 11. And in that passage, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about false teaching. And I think that we have somehow an idea in America today, I have found, if someone's on television or on the radio or in a blog or has the name reverend or pastor or doctor or whatever it might be, somehow we give them instant credibility. And that's very dangerous. The Bible says in the context of false teachers that Satan comes as an angel of light. Have you ever meditated on what that might mean? Because I think we think that if a person is a bad person, teaching bad things, you know, they're going to have long, terrible fingernails and fangs and blood on them, and they're going to, you know, look evil. We're not going to think that they're nice and that they're not good speakers. We're not going to think that they're attractive. In fact, we're oftentimes going to think that their teaching is way over here when this is truth. And the reality is uh, falsehood is not over here. It's usually right here. And the Bible says that he comes as an angel of light that Satan and his teachings are very appealing, and we need to be very cautious. What's the answer? John talks about the apostolic circle. says, he goes of God listens to us. How do we listen to the apostles today? We have his word. We have his word, and it's adequate to teach us. I want to come back to that. But let's go on about how David lived his life. 7 through 12 says this, And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Saul said, God's delivered David into my hands. Saul knew good and well that David was his replacement. Saul knew good and well that he was wrong. He says that multiple times when he's talking to David. Saul knew that. And who did God, Saul attribute this to? Hey, God's done it. God's given me victory. One of my teachers said, sometimes we blame God for the weirdest things. And that's true here. He goes on. For he has shut himself by entering in a town that has gates and bars. Then Saul called all people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. See what he's doing? He's going to the Lord again. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And he said, yep, he is. And David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men to the hand of Saul? After all, I've been kind to them. I just delivered them from the Philistines. And he said, yep, they'll deliver you. David is going to be betrayed by the Ziphites, and now God told him. The inhabitants of Keilah... Had, uh, had no doubt heard about Saul's destruction of Nob. They're probably scared to death. This is the guy that just slaughtered all the priests. Their reaction was understandable, but it was a betrayal. So David doesn't act like Saul. He doesn't feel sorry for himself, but keeps his eyes on the Lord. He acts wisely and saves himself and those with him. I just want to make this point in your notes. When we're wronged, it's very easy to shift our focus onto ourselves become self-centered and lose the power of the Spirit. Your only hope for living your Christian life is the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's there when we're spiritually minded, when we're living our lives by faith. And men and women, when we allow ourselves to become self-oriented, 
that's when the Spirit's power leaves us. That's when we start living out of our flesh. And so David doesn't feel sorry for himself like Saul does. Nobody feels sorry for me. Nobody tells me this. He's self-oriented, and it leads him to one mistake after another, and it will you too. And what happens is when we feel needs in our life, do you ever notice who we start talking about? Me. We start talking about us. And the caution here is to not become self-centered. David could easily have done that. What? They're going to betray me? He doesn't get that way. All of our answers to prayer will not be what we want. I realize that's a shocker. But the reality is God is good. And we have to keep telling ourselves that. We have to keep orienting ourselves to truth. Look at the contrast here between David and Saul. When Keilah is attacked, God does what Saul should have done. David consults God while Saul uses spiritual language, but there's no record of him seeking the Lord. Do you remember what Saul was, did when God told him to do such and such two different times? Chapter 13, he comes back and he's got all the spoil. Remember, or in chapter, that's 15. In 13, he offers up a sacrifice when Saul doesn't come or Samuel doesn't come when he thought he was supposed to. Do you remember what he said? He said, you know, I saw the Philistines gathering to me. The people were leaving, and I saw you didn't come. And so it seemed good to me to offer up a sacrifice. When we sin, when we stop trusting the Lord, we keep justifying ourselves before God. We keep making excuses for ourselves. We keep blaming other people. You make me so mad. Really? I can control you that way? I feel really powerful. You make me so angry, or I felt I had to do this. I needed to sin. And so we blame others and we rationalize our sin. If it's not revealed in the Word, it's not necessary. Scripture can teach, reprove. What areas of uncertainty in our lives? And so when we live our lives, guys, as we're looking for God's guidance, there's what's black and what's white. There's what we know, what we don't know. There's clear revelation. But the Bible doesn't tell you, you know, what shirt to buy. doesn't tell you what car to buy. doesn't even tell you who to marry, although it gives you some guidelines. That's what's clear. Then there's that large gray area in between. That's what Proverbs is for, to make you wise. So it might tell you, hey, get good counselors. It might tell you to avoid things like excessive use of alcohol, things like that. But the Proverbs are there to give you wisdom. Now here comes the scary part. There are many times where we don't know exactly what God wants us to do. And the Bible gives us freedom to make choice. And that scares us. And so there's times that we'll blame it on God. I think God wants me to do this even though we don't have clear revelation. And can I suggest something to you that may be a shock to your system? Because it can be to mine. Do you know at times like that what you can do? You do the best you can with what you know and you trust him. You trust him. There's a song that says, this my song through endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. And men and women, you're going to find at the end of your lives that you're going to be able to look back and say, the Lord Jesus took care of me all the days of my life. Why is it like that? Because God wanted it that way. For example, 1 Corinthians 10 may be one of the weirder passages in the New Testament. Paul writes this, If an unbeliever invites you to his house and you desire to go, go, asking no question for conscience sake. Isn't that a weird one? We would have rewritten it, wouldn't we? We would have written the passage differently. We would have said, if an unbeliever invites you to his, your house and you've been trained in evangelism explosion, go, asking no questions for conscience sake. Or if an unbeliever invites you to his house and you've got a tract in your back pocket, go ahead and go. Or if an unbeliever invites you to his house and then you make up a series of things, if you do these ten things, I'll know it's your will, then you can go. It's too bad Paul wasn't as spiritual as we are today. All Paul could think to write in the Word of God is, if an unbeliever invites you to his house and you feel like, go and go. Ask me no question for conscience sake. But there is a freedom, and there can be a trust in the Lord, because we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and delivered himself up for us. And do you know why things are clear in the Bible? Because God wanted them clear in the Bible. Do you know why things are unclear in the Bible? Because God felt there was no need to make them any clearer than he made them. It's not as though the Word of God is inadequate. It's not as though we have to read the Scriptures and say, he blew it here, he should have told me which car. It was an ugly color, I knew when I bought it, I shouldn't have bought it. But we can trust the Lord. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 says it this way. He talks about how, well, let me read it to you. It's a great passage, and it talks about a guy named Melchizedek 
And in 5.11 to 14, he says, concerning him, and he used the New American Standard this time, concerning him we have much to say, and it is difficult, it's hard, because you become hard of hearing. Hard of hearing. What? Hard of hearing. And it says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. He's writing to believers. You guys ought to be teachers. You have need to someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Watch. You have come to need milk and not solid food. And then he explains, solid, he says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a babe. Do you hear what he just said? There is a skill. There, we take the word of God and we learn to use it. And he says, if you don't use what you learn, you're unskilled. You, you actually go backwards spiritually. I'm unskilled in the word of righteousness. The Bible says I'm like an infant. And then he says this in verse 14. Solid food is for the mature. Listen, who by reason of use, by practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And so the Bible compares the Christian life just like working out. You take the word of God, what you learn, you use it, and you mature in it. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 3. He wants the body to grow up. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to mature. And when you know you're supposed to forgive and you don't forgive, you're getting weaker. When you know you're supposed to be kind and you're unkind, you're getting weaker. When you know you're supposed to trust and you don't trust, you're getting weaker. God expects us to take what we learn, including what we're learning today, and use it because that matures us. And if we don't mature, then when we come to difficult situations, it's, a more, difficult, uh, it's diff more difficult for us to get through them. So God wants to take the word and to use the word of God in our lives. That's why it's here. I want to read you something. A friend of mine, Lonnie Hofer, Dr. Hofer and I went to school together, and he's several times gone overseas, and he told me this story. He said in 1993, for the first time they were in Russia, they met with teachers, elementary teachers and middle school teachers, and they gave them for the first time in their lives a Bible. I had another friend of mine, Jody Dillo, who was working with Bible education by extension, and for decades they used to get Bibles behind the Iron Curtain before it fell. And when they would get a page of the Bible, Jody said they would just weep, and they would pour over it and read it over and over again. Here's what Dr. Hofer told me about his trip to Russia. He said when they gave him their first Bible, he says it, it was like they were holding a golden brick. They opened it, and he said, I couldn't get their attention as I taught. They were awestruck that it was theirs. And Lottie said to them, you might want to write your name in it, and they wouldn't do it because in their minds they were desecrating God's holy word. Men and women, these were atheists that were raised in communism. And they said this to Lonnie, no matter what you learn in all your life, all you have to do is look up at the stars and know there's a God. They wouldn't put it on the floor. They wouldn't put it down. The next day he had trouble teaching them because they stayed up all night reading it. And we throw it in the back seat. And we treat it as common. And you don't think this country deserves judgment? You think it's only because of unbelievers who have bad morals that God is disgusted with us? I would lay this at your feet. I think God's disgusted oftentimes with me. And he might be with you as well. I have access to the scriptures anytime I want. Anytime I want, I can read it. Anytime I want, I can listen to it. And if I don't understand it, anytime I want, I can go on the Internet and read 20 different things, 19 of which are maybe wrong. But I can, anytime I want, hear anyone I want on the radio, on the Internet, on television. And I'm too busy because my favorite show has been recorded and I just can't get to it because I'm worn out because of my day. I wonder what the people in Ukraine would give to get their hands on the Scriptures today. We had a word for this when I was a kid. We called it being spoiled. And now you know I'm leaving early today. I'm ashamed of myself. Verse 13 says, So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and where, went wherever they could go. 
Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. David stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. You know what? God couldn't touch him, or Saul couldn't touch David until God said, okay, now you can. So when he saw David, that Saul had come out to seek his life, verse 15, David was, uh, was in the forest of the wilderness of Ziph. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. One of my favorite verses in the whole Old Testament. I love this. Saul has a, a, an army of some of the top military in the world, and he can't find David. Every single day he's after him. And Jonathan goes, I'm going to go see David. And he finds him, and it says he strengthened his hand in the Lord. I want to ask you a question. When your friends are out of it, how do you respond? Just to have coffee, that's a good thing. Have a bite to eat, that's a good thing. He strengthened his hand in the Lord. If you're in need, you weep with those who weep. You hurt with them. But at the right time, you also strengthen them in Jesus. You talk about the God who's behind it all. You talk to them when somebody tells you, I'm battling with this cancer. You tell them that, there's, that Jesus is, will be there by their side the whole way. When they're down and they feel lonely, you let your friends know that Jesus Christ loves them. 1 John chapter 4 says, No man has seen God at any time. When we love one another, God abides in us. You want God in this fellowship? You love one another. Remember what he said to Peter? I talked to you about this before. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, you feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Sure, I love you. Tend my lambs. Peter, you love me. You take care of those I love. If we say we love God and don't, who we have not seen and don't love our brother whom we have seen, we don't get it. We lie. The truth's not in us. We're not getting it. Because as much as we get frustrated with the people around us, God wants us to love them. And God wants us to show them Jesus. God wants us to strengthen them in the Lord. That's what true friendship is. So for the second time in a row, David's betrayed, and then his best friends come to him. Spiritual friendships are concerned for the spiritual well-being of others. David needed encouragement, and Jonathan risked everything to make sure his friend was encouraged. And while we always need to weigh the gravity of situations, we need to say, is this a good idea or not? True friendships make encouragement and the needs of others a priority. I have a question for you. Do you like to be around people that are encouraging? I had a good friend that had stage four cancer. He went to Mayo Clinic, and when they saw what his, it was all about, when they opened him up, they said, one, most of the doctors said, oh, yeah, let's forget it. And maybe the best doctor in the world in that area said, let's see if we can get him a few years. This is a story he told me after the surgery. And he set his life to encouraging others. And you would meet him, you'd say, how you doing? He'd go, I'm fine. And he told me later, he said, nobody likes to hear someone whining all the time. Nobody wants to hear you. He said, usually when they're asking you that, they're, they're like, they want to say, it's a figure of speech. I don't mean it literally. <laughs> I really don't want you to tell me that. And he was one of the most cheerful men. Man, he was the most positive guy, and he encouraged everybody around him. That's what life is all about. It's interesting that Jonathan was able to find David when Saul and his best men could not. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, let's go on. Let's pick it up in 19. By the way, uh, I should back up a little bit here. So Jonathan says in 17 and 18, look at this. Here's how he encouraged him. Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. I'll be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. That was the plan. So the two of, of them made a covenant before the Lord. David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. Look at 19. This should make you say, the creeps, Hebrew word. Then the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in the strongholds in the woods, in the sil hill of Hak Hakalah? which is on the south of Jessamon. Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all your desire, the desire of your soul to come down, and on our part we will deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said to them, Blessed are you of the Lord, even though he's against me, for you have had compassion on me. Thank you, because what matters to me is that you love me. Cheryl, one of Cheryl's favorite jokes is if somebody's talking a lot, if she's talking a lot about herself, she'll say, But enough about me. What do you think of me? 
And that's a lot of people, and that's Saul in this case. You know, what do you think of me? You love me. Sometimes when I'm not feeling well, I'll say to Cheryl, poor Dan, poor Dan, I love him so much. (laughs) Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his hideout is, for who has seen him there? I am told he's very crafty. See, See, he attributes the problem to David, not God. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with certainty. I love that word lurk. I think you should lose it in a sentence this week. And I'll go with you. And it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. So they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. Um, Just these comments. We should be cautious about trusting those whose values are not spiritual. Enough said about that. Notice that Saul uses spiritual language when he knows he's away from the Lord. Religion often persists after spirituality leaves us. We will be unspiritual, we'll we'll, we'll be horrible to our wives, to our children, to our spouses, to our friends, we'll be horrible to them, but we make sure that we look religious in the eyes of other people. Religion will outlive spirituality all the time. Psalm 54, 1 to 7, real quick, just want to read this to you. This is an interesting psalm because in Psalm 54, he talks about this. He talks about the Ziphites. And when I was a kid, that would have been a lighter. But here's what it says. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went out and said to Saul, is not David hiding among us? Look at this. Save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. What's David doing? He's going to God. God is his help. For strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. David's legs have been knocked out to him. He's got nothing left, and now he gets it. God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Isn't that interesting? He's being chased, he's being betrayed, and, God's, and David says, you are good. That's where our faith comes from, is in believing reality, not keeping our eyes on the circumstances. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemy. Is God your helper, or do you have this? Let's come back as we finish this. So they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek, seek him, they told David. Therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David. Watch this. This is fun to end. Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And so David made haste to get away from Saul. For Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. Round and round. They kept chasing each other around the mountain. But a messenger came to Saul saying, Hasten and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called the place the Rock of Escaping. And David went up from there and dwelt in the strongholds of En Gedi. Isn't that something? Can you imagine getting up every day and you're going around the mountain and you've got an army chasing you around and around? That's what David faced every day of his life. So I have this to close. I have this question. Is God your help or do you have this? I got this. I got this. Do you treat prayer and God's word as options because you've got this? I've got this. I want to just suggest this to you today if you're going through difficulty. God will often allow things in our lives to put pressure on us to bring us back, and he will remind us that we don't have life handled, that we need him. Had an argument with your spouse recently, with your parents, with your kids, with your friends? Fantastic. Fantastic. I remember calling my mentor after I'd hit bottom, and I said, man, I have had it. I'm I'm just done. I can't do this anymore. And if you remember, he said to me, good, you're in a place where God can really start teaching you. Man, I wanted to slam that phone down. Don't do that today. That was back then. Slamming the phone down today is a counterproductive kind of a thing. But if you're at the place in your life where you're frustrated, you feel like you're at the end, 
you're probably where I was, where the Lord can really get to you and start teaching you. Real question, men and women, are we teachable? You know, I remember a time when I bottomed out and bottomed out and bottomed out like every week. God will allow things in your life to get to you. The question is, are you letting him get to you? The question is, is God your help or do you have this? I remember Jody telling me about the people getting God's word and weeping over it. Lonnie saying they wouldn't even put their names on it because it was so precious to them. Maybe some of us in this fellowship, I put myself in that category, maybe we need to get right with God in some things about prayer and about our priorities, about God's word. Do you feel privileged to be in America to have this book? Or is it just something that's on your coffee table so it, it's impressive to your neighbors and your friends? The Bible says God is a very present help in, time, in, me, in time of need. If you're down today, if you've had a tough week, if you're struggling, thank the Lord. Use it to come home because God is our help. Not only do we not have life, we never will have life. And as our nation continues to deteriorate and as our personal lives feel that pressure and struggle, God's not going to compromise, men and women. He wants our hearts. He's our helper. David had to learn it. I hope and pray that you will as well. After my prayer, I'm going to ask the, those that are leading us in song to come up. And I hope that as you close the service that you won't leave things here today but you'll go to the Lord as your help. Let's pray together. Our Father, I'm really getting tired of giving messages that are all about me, but thank you so much for showing me my failures, and thank you that you are our help. Thank you that you're there for us, Father. And I do pray about our attitude toward being able to come to you, the freeness to worship here this morning, the fact that we have your precious word. Help us to realize that when David sought help, he sought it one way. We have the completed word of God. I pray that that will grip our hearts, not just today, but that your spirit would graciously remind us every day that the word that we have is the word of God. And we can go to that for our help because you've exalted your word according to all your name. In Christ's name. would like to stand with us let's worship
few minutes the guys are going to come with the wine and Lord I would just uh, ask you to to bless that we we don't take this lightly this this sacrifice that you've made and and when we receive this uh, we would ask that you would hold it and we would take it together and then uh, the little baskets that are at the end of the row you can pass them Looks like everybody has received the cup. Let's have a word of prayer. So we share this cup of blessing in his name, remembering how he himself took a cup in the upper room as the hour of his crucifixion drew near and said, this is my blood, which is shed for many. Do this as often as you drink in it in remembrance of me. Lord, as we drink this wine, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our souls, and your love flows within us. Let's drink the cup.
If you guys would like to stand with us, one more song before we close. just close with a word of prayer here and Lord we just give you thanks that that you don't give up on us when when we are disobedient like David was and God did not give up on him and Lord we thank you for your protection we thank you for the word to ground us the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us Lord we just ask that you would be with us as we go out and be the doers of the word and not just hearers of it, that you would just indwell with us and uh, as we go out and be about your business. In Jesus' name, amen. Got one announcement here from Julie. I think you saw her coming up here. The VBS workers are having a meeting immediately after the service in the fellowship area. For those wanting to stay and visit after the service, it would be helpful if you stayed in the sanctuary space perhaps in the middle here. So Juliet or Gillette can begin cleaning and the VBS people can get their area set up. So 